This channel is part of the History Hit Network. Over 2,000 years ago, the first great European capital cities rose around the shores of the Mediterranean. More and more people lived in increasingly crowded conditions. The arts, commerce and sciences flourished. Struggling for power and influence, these cities tried to outshine each other by erecting magnificent buildings. People from different cultures and parts of the world were drawn to these cities, seeking prosperity and happiness. The incomparable rise of Athens began 500 years before the birth of Christ. No other city has shaped the Western world so much as Athens. History's most famous philosophers lived and taught here. The fine arts and natural sciences blossomed. And it was the citizens of Athens who gave the world a new type of government, democracy. The Greek historian Pausanias wrote about an extraordinary woman of that era. Phryne was one of Athens' most famous iteri, or courtesans. The mistress of important men, scholars, artists and politicians fell under her spell. Her wealth and beauty were legendary. But pride led her into mortal danger. Phryne angered the gods, but it was mortals who would judge her. In the 5th century BC, 300,000 people lived in Athens. The city was at its peak. Then came a long period of decline. And it was only in the 20th century that Athens regained its previous size. Today, it has over 4 million inhabitants. It's just after sunrise. Architect Nikos Togonidis is expecting a special delivery. On the truck is a marble block weighing a ton for one of history's most exciting restoration projects. It has to be hoisted 150 meters up the rocky slope of the Acropolis, or citadel, which was the impregnable center of ancient Athens. The Acropolis is crowned by the city's most famous building, the Parthenon which the Athenians built to celebrate their victory in 479 BC over the Persians. 2,500 years later, this monument is being taken apart and reassembled to rectify the mistakes of 19th century restorations.
The Parthenon was the most outstanding building of its time. A two-story high gallery of columns supported the roof of this temple, erected by the citizens in honor of Athene, the goddess of victory. In the huge entrance hall stood her statue, 12 meters high, decorated with gold and ivory. Today's workshops are exactly where the original workers' huts once stood. After the restoration, the Parthenon will still have its familiar look of a ruin. The approach is to repair or complete the damaged parts and to use newly sculpted marble blocks only when absolutely necessary. It's amazing in every point. As a, we are studying and we are working all these years close to the monument, we are discovering again the same techniques. It's, we are obliged to do the same things because we, we understand finally that it's the best way to do that. Piece by piece, the Parthenon is being dismantled. This is the only way the architectural sins of previous restorations can be corrected. Today's architects aim to make their work as historically accurate as possible. Their respect for the tremendous technical and logistical achievements of the ancient builders increases every day. Knowing all these um, facilities that we have in our hands, papers, computers, whatever, how difficult it is to organize and to control all these things. I cannot imagine that period without paper, imagine where they were drawing, how they can communicate and to do this fine work. It's incredible. The Parthenon was built in 15 years, beginning in 447 BC. The Greek philosophers were laying the foundations of the modern sciences. Pythagoras had developed the basic principles of mathematics and Democritus would soon declare the atom to be the foundation of all things. The Parthenon is proof of the superb building techniques of the ancient Greeks. The sides of these columns are tapered. If extended, the sides would eventually meet at a point several kilometers in the sky. So none of the columns is truly vertical. Yet they are all executed precisely to the millimeter. Every stone has secrets, let's say, uh, from the architectural point of view and the proportions are special, and also there are other things about the, the function, the, the real function of the building. How it's the penetrating the water, for instance. The curvature of the floor, probably it's one of these reasons. Uh, the material that they use uh, to connect the blocks between them, the metal elements, I mean. The technique is uh, similar than the, uh, than the metal work uh, of the Sarakinian swords, for instance. The ancient builders achieved these perfect proportions using only geometric calculations. Compass, ruler and plumb line were their only tools. While the Acropolis was the place to honor democracy with magnificent monuments, it was put into practice at the foot of the hill in the Agora. The Agora was the marketplace of ancient Athens. In the city center, archaeologists from the American School of Classical Studies have been working for the past 70 years. They have unearthed a densely built up residential area at the edge of the Agora. Professor John Camp leads the excavations. The purpose of the excavations is to uncover the center of ancient Athens, that is where the public life took place, uh, and around the big square, which was the Agora proper, there were all the public buildings you needed to run the city. The Senate building, the archive building, the magistrate's offices, the law courts, the mint, pretty much everything you needed in an administrative way was somewhere near the square, and our purpose is to expose the historic center of Athens. 
The Agora was the social and political meeting place of the Athenians. People came to see and to be seen. The history of Phryne begins on the Agora. Phryne has achieved wealth and status through her beauty and intelligence. Her success has aroused envy, and rumors have spread that could prove dangerous to her. Phryne is used to curiosity, but she has no inkling of the scandal that is brewing. She's being accused of a capital offense, blasphemy. She is rumored to have commissioned the sculptor, Praxiteles, to create a statue of the goddess Aphrodite in her own likeness. representation of nude bodies or even erotic scenes was not frowned upon by ancient Athenians. But for an Itera to be portrayed as the goddess of beauty would surely bring divine wrath upon the city. In ancient times, the Agora was an open square shaded by trees and surrounded by spacious arcades. A restored version of such an arcade, the two-story Stoa of Atalos, now houses the American School of Classical Studies. Here, in the shade, the Athenian merchants had their stalls, and citizens gathered to exchange news and gossip. Nowadays, the finds from the Agora excavations are examined and archived here at the Institute. The square itself was used for a variety of functions. One day they might set up booths and have a market. On another day they might be using it for an election. Another time it could be for athletic contests, for military drill for festivals, for, for spectacles of all sorts. So it would be used for a variety of purposes uh, every single day, but not always the same purpose. And then around it in the, in the buildings is simply where the city was managed by the magistrates, by the bouli or the senate of the 500, uh, and by the boards and commissions, the water commissioners, the grain commissioners, all the people responsible for running this huge city had their, their administrative offices somewhere right next to the square. Even in a large city like Athens, the Agora functioned as a village square. Direct communication between citizens was the basis for the development of democracy. The archaeologists have found a deep well at the edge of the Agora. It was dug at the time the Parthenon was built. <laughs> Professor Camp's team has been studying this well for three years now. They are gradually getting an idea of what this site may once have looked like. Behind the administrative buildings adjoining the Agora, narrow little streets led into a cramped, densely built-up residential area. Here lived the common citizens, close to the place that contributed so significantly to the development of democracy. While there were certainly very rich houses and elegant villas, most of the houses we have near the Agora are very poor and not very comfortable. They have 
clay floors. Their rooms are centered around a courtyard, which would pro have provided some light and air, but they would have been very dark from our point of view, very badly furnished, probably not too many windows because you, no way of closing them off and still letting the light in. So I think that's one of the reasons that such an outdoor public life as being home wasn't all that much fun. The artifacts are analyzed and classified in the Institute's laboratory. Sometimes it's the small items that reveal a great deal about larger issues. The purpose and significance of these small bowls was a puzzle at first. They were found near the hearth in the dwellings of humble Athenians, alongside the burnt bones of small animals. They may have been sacrificial bowls for domestic religious rituals, asking the gods for health, happiness and success in business. Religion played a large part in Athenian daily life. The visible proof of that was the Parthenon. An elaborate frieze that once crowned the Parthenon illustrates the Athenians' relationship with their gods. It was originally painted, but the colors wore away long ago. The frieze shows the magnificent annual procession of the Athenians to the Acropolis in honor of their patron, Athene. The Panathenia was a colorful procession up the steep hill where charioteers demonstrated their skill at maneuvering their nimble chariots. Venerable elders accompanied the procession. Young men carried heavy amphoras of water. The Panathenia involved sacrificing animals to the gods. Such events were always a big celebration for everyone. There were no priests in democratic Athens. Athenians related to their gods in a relaxed and confident way. The gods frequently descended from Mount Olympus, taking on human form to mingle with mortals and enjoy themselves licentiously. But the gods demanded humility and absolute respect from mortals. The Athenians know that Praxiteles is working on a statue of Aphrodite, the goddess of beauty. And the rumors actually seem to be true. Phryne is the model for the image of the goddess. If gods take on human form, it's seen as an expression of their divinity. But for a mortal woman to allow herself to be represented as a goddess is a crime. By this presumption, Phryne puts her life and liberty at risk. In Athens, the well-to-do citizens were the chief patrons of artists such as Praxiteles. It was considered good form to support the arts. Greek culture flourished thanks to this spirit of patronage. Even today, the art of ancient Athens provides people with a livelihood. Reproductions of antique art objects are sold all over the world. The art of casting in bronze lives on in this Athenian workshop. It was one of the earliest technologies and has been practiced for over 4,000 years. 
A tripodon, a large bowl on three legs, is being cast today. A new mould is made for every casting, and each of the many individual parts requires a separate mould. Generations of fathers have passed down to their sons the composition of a special kind of earth that makes it possible to produce these detailed casting moulds. Έχουμε μάθει αυτή τη δουλειά από παπούδες πολλές γενές, από παπούς στο πατέρα, ο πατέρα στο γιο και ούτω καθεξής. Έτυχε να μάθω και εγώ αυτή τη δουλειά, τη συνεχίζω και θα τη συνεχίσω ώστε να σταματήσουμε. Έχω αρκετά χρόνια στη δουλειά, περίπου 30. The mold for the underside of the bowl is ready. With an ordinary spoon. The bronze caster is digging channels into which the liquid bronze will later be poured. The inside of the bowl is decorated with delicate reliefs. This is the most difficult part because every detail must be correct before the molds are put together. The bronze has been heated for over two hours. Now the molten metal is poured into the molds. Από το μικρότερο μέχρι το μεγαλύτερο, το τυπώνεις και δεν ξέρεις στο τέλος αν θα σου βγει. Το να μην βγει υπάρχουν πολλοί τρόποι. Μπορεί να είναι το χώμα βρεγμένο πολύ, μπορεί να το σφίξεις πολύ, μπορεί να σου πέσουν χώματα, να μην κάνεις τις μπουκαδούρες σωστά και να μην σου βγει στο τέλος. Άγχος υπάρχει. Opening the earth mold destroys it. Now we will see if the cast has been successful. Piece by piece, the foundry workers lift the separate parts out of the steaming molds. There is still a great deal of delicate work to be done before the tripodon is completed. Tripodons played a special role in the ancient world. They were handed out as prizes to the patrons of successful plays. Frini, who financed a theatre group, also received such a prize. The Tripodons were placed on high stone pedestals in public view, lining the street leading to the theatre, which is still called Tripodon Street. The vast majority of ancient bronze artworks have disappeared, melted down by later generations. Many marble statues were burned to make lime. Textiles and almost all wood or leather artifacts have also been lost. The ancient world was colorful and traders brought exotic goods to Athens from all over the world. The market where today's inhabitants of the old city shop for their fresh fruit, vegetables, meat and fish. The ancient Athenians ate more modestly. Very few could afford meat. Poorer people ate it only when an animal was sacrificed for a special festival. Small animals were kept in the house and supplied milk and eggs. But Athens was close to the sea, so at least there was plenty of fish, which, with bread and thick lentil soup, formed the staple diet. 
Fruit and vegetables were very different from today's. The melons were tiny, apples rare, and it was two millennia before potatoes and tomatoes reached Europe. But in addition to figs and olives, Athenians were also fond of grasshoppers and cicadas, which Aristotle praised as great delicacies. It's fairly clear that Athenian trading connections were, were very extensive. A lot of their grain, maybe most of their grain, came from the Ukraine, from the north side of the Black Sea. Uh, they were importing wine from Asia Minor and the island of Rhodes. Uh, Athenian coins uh, have been found in Egypt. They've been found uh, practically as far away as Afghanistan and uh, far to the west as well. Now, the coins obviously can pass from hand to hand. Uh, but uh, it's clear that goods came in from all over the world. Amphoras were the universal containers for transporting goods in antiquity. Hundreds were excavated at the Agora alone. Athens was a trading power, and democracy took up a great deal of citizens' time. But no one would lose money by taking part in political decisions. The potter who made these amphoras also received money when he went to vote. Outside the city gates were the city's quarries. In scorching heat, thousands of slaves cut the marble for Athens' magnificent buildings. It is estimated that there were three slaves to every free citizen of Athens. Today, the marble used to reconstruct the Parthenon is cut by a handful of workers using heavy equipment. The latest technology is used to cut the marble. Specialists drill holes several meters into the rock. Long steel cables set with diamond chips are threaded through the rock like a giant bandsaw to cut blocks weighing several tons. But the ancient methods of getting marble for buildings, such as the Parthenon, have not been lost either. The stone is still split the same way as it was 2,000 years ago, with heavy hammers, iron chisels, and a deep knowledge of the structure of marble. The gigantic blocks had to be transported many kilometers to the Acropolis. Carts, pulled by several teams of oxen, hauled the huge loads. And while in the city, splendid monuments were being erected to the glory of democracy, in the quarries, those at the bottom of society were slaving under the most inhumane conditions. Slavery was certainly a fact of daily life, and it's, I think, more a question of manpower than anything. Uh, but when we look at the records for the buildings on the Acropolis, we find that free Athenians, Greeks from other city-states, and slaves all worked on the building together, all doing exactly the same jobs, and all being paid a daily wage. Uh, and the, the lot of a slave varied tremendously. At the bottom end of the scale, they worked in the silver mines, and their lives must have been very hard and very short. Uh, there were slaves who were public servants, like accountants, uh, whose lives were not too bad. And some slaves even ran some of the major banks in Athens. Slavery was taken completely for granted, even in the enlightened democracy of Athens. While Athenian citizens were primarily concerned with politics, slaves guaranteed the commercial success of the city. Many slaves were well-trained artisans. Their work is the model for today's stonemasons on the Acropolis. New pieces for the Parthenon are chiseled from the blocks with utmost precision. A 
When the chisels become blunt, the blacksmith provides new sharp tools. Like Hephaestus, the god of fire and forge, he has mastered the interplay of fire and water to produce hard steel. The finest tools for the best stonemasons in Greece. In the residential quarter around the Agora, buildings were constructed with much less care. Houses were small and cramped. Even though their inhabitants were not the rich of Athens, here too, archaeologists are uncovering shards of elaborately painted bowls and vessels. When restored, they provide an impressive image of Greek daily life. mostly reflects the aristocratic style of living, and there were plenty of aristocrats and rich people even in democratic Athens. Uh, there are some pots that show sort of normal activities in shops and fishmongers cutting up fish and butchers and people working in workshops, but generally the art is, is sponsored by the aristocracy and they're gonna be interested in feasting and hunting and partying and the things that aristocrats like to do. Athenian democracy had deprived the aristocracy of power. Every citizen had equal rights, but not all citizens were equal. Many old aristocratic families harked back to a long tradition of privilege and still had considerable wealth and influence even in the democracy. They were the ones who could afford these costly amphoras. The best vase painters were famous throughout Greece and their work fetched high prices. Dimitris Tethopoulos carries on the art of the ancient masters with great passion. The secret lies in the paint. Liquid clay is used to paint the vases before firing. Only after they've been fired in the kiln do the vases acquire their characteristic color. But it isn't just the artistic or technical aspects of the painter's work that matter to him. When he drinks someone from a pot of water, he doesn't use only 50% of the European system that he has in his hand. When he goes down from the pot and drinks the water, he has another feeling. Because he drinks all the water and he uses the whole European system that we have in our hand. Όταν θα πει κάποιος από μία κύλικα, φτάνει το υγρό μέχρι την άκρη των χιλιών του και έχει μια τελείως διαφορετική αίσθηση. The symposia of Athenian high society were famous. In those days, symposium meant simply drinking session. <laughs> Rich Athenians attended lavish feasts with music and dancing. The symposia hosted by Phryne were legendary. Her guests were philosophers, artists, and politicians. This evening, Praxiteles is the center of attention. He has announced that he will soon unveil his statue of Aphrodite. The guests vie at telling tales, while drinking games and riddles amuse the men and their courtesans.
In the course of the evening, the drinking bowls reveal their secret. Με τους κιματισμούς που μπορεί να κάνει μέσα το νερό ή το κρασί που έχει, η ζωγραφική που υπάρχει μέσα είτε αναφέρεται σε θεούς, είτε αναφέρεται σε ερωτικές πράξεις, είτε αναφέρεται σε αθλητισμό και τα λοιπά, κινείται και έχει μια αίσθηση επαφής με το Θεό ή με οποιαδήποτε παράσταση έχει μέσα. Συν τις άλλες, αυτές οι μεγάλες κύλικες μπορούσε κανείς να πει σχεδόν ξαπλωμένος γιατί αυτοί συνήθως καθόντουσαν επάνω σε ανάγκλητρα, τα οποία ήταν μισοξαπλωμένος και πίνανε κατά αυτόν τον τρόπο. Ενώ η Νοχώος έβαζε το κρασί όπως αυτός ήταν ξαπλωμένος, έπινε. But this evening, Freeney's symposium is disrupted. Praxiteles' slave would not normally be allowed to intrude, but the news he has rushed through the dark streets to tell is too appalling. Vrini has a premonition of the catastrophe. At the studio, their worst fears are confirmed. Intruders have broken in and smashed Praxiteles' work, thus revealing Freeney's secret. The whole city knows that Freeney intended to create the image of a goddess in her own likeness. No mortal has ever dared do this. disturbed the delicate balance between the worlds of the gods and of mortals. To ensure the continued benevolence of the gods on Mount Olympus, the Athenians established holy places throughout their realm. They honored more than their patron, Athene. The temple at Cape Sunion was dedicated to Poseidon, the god of the sea who protected shipping and trade with the colonies. Athens had established commercial links from Sicily to the Black Sea. There were even Greek settlements in Egypt. But the gods were known to be capricious. It was better not to rely only on them. To safeguard their influence and repel enemies, Athens maintained an enormous navy. Pride of the fleet were the triremes, war galleys with three banks of oars, which were able to protect the heavily loaded cargo ships. In the harbour at Piraeus, 200 of these ships were waiting to be deployed. One of the civic duties of Athenians was to crew these dreaded warships. Fully mobilised, the Athenian fleet required 40,000 oarsmen. 
While the rich could pay for the upkeep of the fleet and send their slaves to sea, the poor had no choice but to do the rowing themselves. Every trireme was manned by 170 oarsmen. They were often crammed together for days on end and the heat below deck must have been dreadful. At the beginning of the 5th century BC, the great strategist Themistocles convinced the Athenians to invest a large proportion of their national assets in the fleet, thus turning the city-state into a sea power. For a few decades, Athens dominated the Eastern Mediterranean and the numerous Greek city-states. But soon, the old conflicts broke out again and Greece became embroiled in seemingly endless wars once more. Warfare was virtually a, a yearly occurrence uh, and these are citizen armies so that virtually everybody must have fought quite frequently. They were all eligible for military duty from age 18 to 59. They had large land armies and they had those huge fleets that required tens of thousands of rowers. So I think most Athenians experienced war uh, several times in the course of their lives. Uh, it's, it's done seasonally, that is to say, if you're a farmer, you're gonna tend your fields first and then go fight your neighbor when you're not trying to get in your crop. But uh, it was a, a part of daily life, no question. The theatre provided distraction from daily cares. Under the guardianship of Mary Dionysus, the god of wine, playwrights pilloried often coarsely, the abuses prevalent in their society. Dignitaries and politicians in their seats of honor were often the targets of this public mockery. <laughs> Theater was a democratic institution to which every Athenian had access. There was room for more than 17,000 spectators in the steeply tiered seating. Political decisions were made on the Pnyx, the place of the People's Assembly, an inconspicuous open space within sight of the Acropolis. Here, the first parliament in history assembled. The most famous orators of antiquity stood on these steps and addressed the citizens of Athens. Voting by show of hands took place on the Pnyx, the birthplace of democracy. Athenians lived in an information society. Every citizen was obliged to learn to read and write. During the excavations at the Agora alone, thousands of inscriptions on stone were uncovered. Public appeals, information for citizens, or funerary inscriptions like this stela. In a democracy such as the Athenian one, virtually the entire government would change every year, except for a handful of officials. And that means you need very, very good record keeping because not all the projects are going to stop in a year and somebody has to keep track of the money. So you have to say how much money you got when you became the grain commissioner, how you spent that money, and how much money you, you passed on the following year to the next grain commissioner. So essentially, uh, you have to have excellent record-keeping uh, because of this constant changing of the officials. The Greek script has not changed in more than 2,000 years. This dealer 
was erected in memory of a young woman whose name is immortalized here beside her husband's. No other culture has left behind so much written evidence as Athens. So we know that Phryne did actually live. However, whether the details of her story are truth or fiction is still in doubt. The court of Athens is in session. Phryne appears flanked by her lawyer, Iperides, and is met by her accuser. Not even her influential patrons have been able to prevent the legal proceedings. Opinion in the city has turned against the famous courtesan. If the jury finds her guilty, she faces the threat of banishment, slavery, or even death. But Freni knows what she is doing. To everyone's surprise, Iparidis does not dispute the charge against Freni. Then she herself provides the proof that her beauty is worthy of a goddess. If ever there was a mortal woman who might lend her body to Aphrodite, it is free. The independent judicial system was one of the greatest achievements of Athenian democracy. Citizens had no obligation to any ruler or god, only to themselves. A demonstration of this is the Propylia, which is also being restored. For 2,500 years, the Propylia has been the gateway to the Acropolis and the Parthenon. Like the Parthenon, the Propylia is being renovated in a historically accurate way. To this end, every stone is being removed cleaned of old mortar and restored. The architect Tassos Tanoulas is overseeing the work, first planned over 30 years ago. His interests extend beyond architecture. For him, the Propylia is a symbol of Athenian democracy. What appears to be a temple is not dedicated to any god. Rather, it is a place of leisure for the citizens of Athens. The Propylaea is uh, par excellence a secular building. I mean, and it, this is a new idea in uh, the uh, ancient Greek architecture. Uh, this is a building which was meant for the people. It had uh, benches all around, uh, along, all along the walls of the porches and the central building, and also uh, the rooms of the um, uh, wings which uh, were never built, or the Pinakotheki, which still is a room. They were meant for sacrificial meals, so they were for the people to, be, to enter them and to enjoy their architecture and luxury. So there was a temple's luxury in a secular building. For the first time in history, a splendid building such as the Propylia was not erected for gods or kings, 
but by citizens for the citizens of a free city. It is a symbol of the self-confidence and pride of democratic Athens. Phryne has been acquitted, and Praxiteles can now complete the statue to praise and honor Aphrodite. The historian Posanias reports that the goddess was flattered by Phryne's beauty, and the gods were reconciled with Athens. Though the original is lost, the statue is thought to be the first significant nude of a woman ever sculpted. The rise of Athens to a leading position among Greek cities was due to democracy, which led to an unparalleled blossoming of the arts and sciences in the 4th and 5th centuries BC. The power of Athens extended far beyond Greece and throughout the Mediterranean. But even in ancient times, the influence of the metropolis began to wane. Other cities took over its leading role, cities such as Alexandria, Carthage, and Rome. But none of those could dispute the place of Athens in history. This was the cradle of democracy. Over 2,000 years ago, the first great European capital cities rose around the shores of the Mediterranean. More and more people lived in increasingly crowded conditions. The arts, commerce, and sciences flourished. Struggling for power and influence, these cities tried to outshine each other by erecting magnificent buildings. People from different cultures and parts of the world were drawn to these cities, seeking prosperity and happiness. The entrance to the harbour of one of antiquity's mega cities, Alexandria. It was founded in 331 BC by Alexander the Great. The Greek commander had just conquered Egypt and wanted to establish a new royal city in his own honor on the western edge of the Nile Delta. His architects designed the city on a grid pattern to be built on unoccupied ground. For decades, Alexandria was the largest construction site of the ancient Mediterranean. It attracted people from everywhere, among them the most important thinkers of the time. Alexandria became the cultural center of the ancient world. Today, over four million people live in Egypt's second largest city. The modern metropolis has buried ancient Alexandria under concrete and asphalt. Only deep beneath the city, and in the expanses of the Egyptian desert, can evidence of Alexandria's mysterious past be found. What knowledge was stored in the legendary library of Alexandria? Where stood the famous lighthouse, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world? 
What drew people to Alexandria from around the world? One of these stories has come down to us, the story of Agnodiki, who came from Athens to the young metropolis to seek her fortune. The stellar rise of Alexandria has preoccupied the French archaeologist Jean-Yves Empereur for over 10 years. He's the director of the Centre for Alexandrian Studies. His research reveals that the ancient metropolis was a city of gigantic dimensions. The streets are wider than in any other city. The Via Canopica, the Canopic Way, was more than 30 meters wide. And so it's incredible size for the, uh, if you compare with the ancient cities like Athens or Corinth. It's, uh, it's like New York compared to Paris or London, you know? And even uh, they had the skyscraper, like the lighthouse. Uh, so the Greek who came from the old trees, from the islands, were very much impressed when they came to the city. The lighthouse, with its gleaming white marble facade, rose 140 meters into the sky. It was a conspicuous landmark and a symbol of Alexandria's power. Construction of the lighthouse began in 299 BC, based on plans by Sostratus of Cnidos. After 20 years of construction, the gigantic tower was finally nearing completion. It was a symbol of hope for all those making the perilous voyage to Alexandria. It was a beacon for Agnadiki too, whose story is told by the Roman scholar Hyginius. Nothing remains of the lighthouse today. Not even its location is certain. However, there are many indications that this is where it stood. Today, the harbour entrance is dominated by a building from the 15th century, Fort Kate Bay. Renovations on this Arab citadel have recently begun. They offer a rare opportunity to uncover the building's secrets. Did the ruins of the lighthouse provide materials to build the fort? Ein deutscher Ingenieur hat Anfang des 20. Jahrhunderts eine groß angelegte Untersuchung über die Zitadelle gemacht und er behauptet aufgrund Studien von den arabischen Autoren, dass sich der Pharos Stumpf immer noch in der Zitadelle selber in dem Hauptturm befindet. Dies kann aber nur durch Grabung untersucht werden und wir sind jetzt dabei, rund um den Turm herum an verschiedenen Stellen Sondagen zu machen. Das heißt, in kleinen Fenstern runter zu gucken auf den Fels, um zu sehen, ob wir irgendwo die Abmessungen für die Fundamente finden, irgendwelche Spuren, die auf den Leuchtturm hinweisen. Katrin Machinek ist ein Architekt on Dr. Empereurs Team. Under the fort is a huge system which could supply enough water to last out a lengthy siege. The system is like a museum of architectural history. There are Corinthian capitals and ancient columns. Do they include fragments of the lighthouse? The site of Kaibe is a, a mixed site of uh, um, architectural pieces belonging to the lighthouse itself. We could, for instance, reconstruct a very huge door, more than 12, or up to 13 meters from the lentil uh, to, to the soil. 
with very night jams and lintel of granite from Aswan. Uh, we have some colossal statues uh, which stood on, in this place because we have found them parallels one to the other uh, just in front of their bases. So they are very uh, big statues of the uh, kings, Ptolemies and their queens which were standing during antiquity at the foot of the lighthouse. Most likely, Fort Kate Bay stands on the spot once occupied by the mightiest lighthouse of all time. It guided mariners safely into Alexandria's harbor for 1,500 years, until it was toppled by an earthquake. What has remained is its legend. The best builders of the times were brought to Alexandria to create this architectural miracle. Among them was Kratis, brother of Agnadike's mother. As a young engineer, he had taken up Alexander the Great's call and followed him here. Agnadike has arrived from Athens. Having survived an arduous and dangerous sea voyage. Agnodike has a bold plan, which she can realize only in Alexandria. The very first traces of the city of Alexandria are found out at sea on a small rocky island off the coast, Nelson Island. Professor Paolo Gallo, after years of negotiation, is the first scientist allowed to explore this barren island in a secure military zone. Here, he expects to unearth important information on the origins of Alexandria. His early findings seem to justify his hopes. The most striking feature of what we found, it is that we found the only uh, levels which are intact belonging to this period. I mean, in Alexandria itself, it is very difficult to find uh, periods of the first Ptolemaic um, age uh, in which all the things are still in situ. So there we found all the pottery and all the things that were abandoned at once. Much to Gallo's surprise, this outpost was abandoned shortly after Alexandria's founding and has remained uninhabited ever since. Just below ground level, the foundations of a large building have emerged. Was this a temple, a lighthouse, or a military installation? On the steep cliffs along the shore, the archaeologists stumbled across the entrance to an underground gallery, part of an ancient system. In the 17th century, English sailors sought shelter here. Here is written, Helen Lux, 1658, and this is his portrait. So a man of this period with the barbiche and the moustache. Two thousand years earlier, Alexander the Great's soldiers made camp on the island. We discovered houses belonging to soldiers of this period. Uh, and for sure there was a military garrison there. We found big bowls of catapults in the houses. The island was strategically positioned facing Canopus, Egypt's most important Mediterranean port until the founding of Alexandria. From this island, Alexander the Great could control the Egyptian harbor and also speed up construction of his royal city. This military garrison uh, was occupied only during a short period, during, during about, uh, about almost between 30 and 40 
years, no more. So after this was completely abandoned. So we can understand from this that was abandoned because the strategical interest of the islet and of Canopus itself and the harbour of Canopus uh, was lost because the new harbour, that of Alexandria, was uh, already working. Was the island perhaps also a kind of planning office for the city going up on the mainland? Alexandria was an experimental city. Newer excavations show the complexity of the work undertaken by ancient engineers. By now, archaeologists from Dr. Empereur's team have become specialists in rescue digs on construction sites. Each time a point of entry to ancient Alexandria is uncovered, a race against time begins for the archaeologists. Many promising sites are rapidly covered over again by the building contractors. For them, Every day of archaeological excavation represents a financial loss. De façon générale, dans la ville d'Alexandrie, pour atteindre les niveaux hellénistiques, il faut une puissance stratigraphique de 12 mètres. Pour atteindre ce niveau-là, il faut passer à travers des couches, les couches de l'époque médiévale, de l'époque musulmane, ensuite de l'époque romaine, pour arriver aux couches de l'époque hellénistique et nous nous devons fouiller toutes ces couches là jusqu'au terrain naturel. This area near the ancient palace has been inhabited continuously since the founding of the city, but it is difficult to interpret the sequence of historical eras. Still, discoveries have been made here that show how far sighted the Greek city planners were. Cisterns and water pipes have been found. They show the progressive way Alexandrian engineers solved the problem of a city that lacked spring water. The first thing the Greeks laid down for the new metropolis was a network of prefabricated clay pipes for the water supply. As in modern water systems, the mass-produced ancient pipes with their cone-shaped ends fitted exactly into one another. Tens of thousands of such pipes must have been laid below ground before work began on the roads. The entire infrastructure, the layout of roads and paths and the position of buildings must have been determined in detail from the start, a masterpiece of planning. Water from the Nile and from natural reservoirs near the city flowed through canals to the city's ingenious network of water pipes. Two hundred kilometers inland is the region of Fayum, which in antiquity was the granary for the city of Alexandria. In this fertile region, time seems to have stood still. To this day, the ancient form of irrigation, as simple as it is ingenious, has been preserved. Powered by the water itself, the wheel raises the precious liquid in its scoops and empties it into canals. When the water reached Alexandria, it had to be stored and distributed. An underground cistern. 
Isabel Lairi from the Center for Alexandrian Studies has been researching the hidden water reservoirs of the city for years. The El Nabi system is the best preserved. It dates from the time of Arab rule in Alexandria. Ces matériaux proviennent de la surface, de bâtiments qui ont été démontés, déconstruits, et qui, à l'époque où ces citernes ont été construites, étaient certainement abandonnés. Donc, nous raconte également l'histoire de la ville aux différentes époques qui ont précédé la période arabe. When the Arabs reached the city during the 8th century AD, they built huge water systems. A thousand years earlier, the Greeks had solved the problem of water supply in a different but no less spectacular manner. Donc, it's a réseau dynamique formé de canaux creusés dans la roche profondément. Ces canaux partaient du canal d'Alexandrie qui venait prendre la qui se connectait avec la branche canopique du Nil et apportait l'eau jusque aux portes d'Alexandrie. Des de ce canal partaient certainement des canaux à ciel ouvert ou peut-être des aqueducs et amenaient de l'eau dans le réseau souterrain qui euh, ressortait par le biais de puits à l'intérieur même des maisons. Only a few years after the city's founding in 331 BC the population of Alexandria had increased to half a million. But its architects had anticipated the growth of the settlement and had designed a road system built on a grid which could handle a high volume of traffic. The two main traffic arteries of modern Alexandria date back to when the city was founded. They're the same size they were over 2,000 years ago. Magnificent palaces and temples lined the avenues in those days. But how did ordinary Alexandrians live? Grzegorz Majerik from Warsaw University has managed to excavate the remains of residential buildings from the city's beginnings. Each uh, owner was assigned the same, was allotted the same uh, lot of land, roughly 25 by 25 meters, to build his house on it. And we think that this system that, backs, uh, uh, that goes back to the time of Alexander the Great was retained at least for four centuries in Alexandria. A well-to-do family lived on about 600 square meters of land enough for a spacious villa surrounded by gardens and stables. Discoveries such as this house with its Greek mosaic are rare, but everyday items from Alexandria are even rarer. Alexandria's Greco-Roman Museum houses the few remaining artifacts from that time, including the precious Tanagra figurines. They were always found in the graves of young women, for whom the figurines were probably companion, toy, and lucky charm. Ancient Alexandria was not only the most modern city of its time, but also the center of knowledge. Only here can Agnodiki fulfill her greatest wish, to study medicine and become a doctor. Even in Alexandria, this was unthinkable for a woman. A taboo Agnodike must break if she wants to achieve her goal. In cosmopolitan Alexandria, the image of women was shaped by Greek ideals. The proof is in the details of the Tanagra figurines. The elaborate painting has survived the centuries. The figurines show Alexandrian women followed Greek fashion in their clothes and hair. 
But did they follow Greek conventions in other respects as well? In Alexandria, the Greeks had encountered a pharaonic tradition. Whereas in Greece, a woman's life was intended to be passed within the confines of the home, Egypt boasted some powerful female rulers. You could find all the races of the people of the world. All the languages were spoken in Alexandria. And even in the library, you could find papyri books between brackets, within, uh, written in any language of the world and translated from Egyptian to Greek, from uh, Aramean, Hebrew uh, to Greek and so on. So it's, it was uh, the melting pot of uh, antiquity. Like every big city, Alexandria was from the outset a major center of production. One effect of living so closely together was the division of labor and specialization. People sold their goods and bought their food on the street. The only meal that ordinary people usually had at home was the evening meal. Breakfast was generally bread dipped in wine. Where fishermen bring their catch to shore today, the slaves of 2,300 years ago unloaded the merchant ships. Goods from all over the Mediterranean were loaded and unloaded here. Alexandria Harbour was Egypt's gate to the world. At the beginning of the 19th century, ancient Alexandria had been almost completely forgotten. Then by pure chance, the driver of a cab made an astonishing discovery. It brought to light the history hidden beneath the city and gave a fascinating insight into this Greek settlement in Egypt. Early one morning, he hitched up his horse and went to work on the streets of Alexandria. In one of the narrow lanes, the road suddenly gave way beneath him and revealed the entrance to a long forgotten world. The city of the dead, the catacombs of Qom el Shokafa. 20 meters beneath the bustle of the modern port city lies an extensive network of caves carved out of the rock. Here, the people of Alexandria buried their dead. This sarcophagus is decorated with Greek vine leaves and with Egyptian gods. It expresses the peaceful coexistence between the newly arrived Greek settlers and the indigenous Egyptians. This coexistence was fostered by General Ptolemy, who assumed power here after the death of Alexander the Great. His heirs continued this policy, and thus Ptolemaic culture came into being. Cosmopolitan and dedicated to progress, Alexandria became a center of knowledge. This is why Agnodike II has come to Alexandria. But because official avenues are closed to her, she is resorting to a dangerous ruse. She must become a man. Her uncle Kratis tries to change her mind, but she will not be deterred by his warnings. Agnodike is bold, but she is also keenly aware of the danger she must face if she is to enter the world of knowledge to which only men have access.
knowledge is power. That was the insight of the Ptolemaic rulers. Their legacy was some splendid monuments. For Dr. Empereur, the Temple of Taposiris is an impressive example of the magnificent buildings that must once have graced Alexandria. Taposiris is in the westernmost part of Alexandria. It indicates the size of the area ruled by the Ptolemies. The whole region was a flourishing commercial district with a harbour, warehouses, vineyards and small workshops. The position of this uh, temple is strategic because we are here at the end of the territory of Alexandria. There was a wall, what they called the Arab Wall, here to prevent any people to enter this area without paying the customs. So they had to go through a gate there on the lake and even all the ships sailing on this lake had to go through a small bridge and to pay also the customs to enter Alexandria territory. This area was heavily populated. The temple was surrounded by its own town with its own infrastructure. Next to the temple district were extensive residential areas and artisans' workshops producing goods of all kinds. To this day, the shards of hundreds of thousands of amphorae still lie here. So this is only a very small part of the big dam. And uh, you can see uh, there are some uh, bottom of amphras and it's uh, pointed to stand in the sand, to stand in the kiln, to stand in the ships where they were transported to uh, exportation. This is a handle, double handle, you see, a very strong one, with a figure imprint of the pottery maker, you can see it when he did it. So uh, thousands of amphras made by many, many people who participated to this production, mass production for mass exportation to Alexandria and to the rest of the Mediterranean. In ancient times, mass production probably looked much like this. In a remote inland river valley, thousands of amphorae are still produced today. The process has not changed. People still get their clay from the river. Even today, people cannot imagine daily life without amphorae, which are used to keep food cool or to transport it. Just as in the workshops around ancient Alexandria, there are no machines here. Everything is made entirely by hand. A chance discovery revealed how so many clay vessels could be produced at once. These are the remains of an enormous amphora kiln, destroyed by an explosion. Until recently, it was hidden under a mountain of shards. In this kiln, more than 600 amphorae could be fired simultaneously.
you have a lot of uh, questions with such a kin, and uh, I think that uh, they have a lot of problems. You, you can see the, the eye of the, of the dump. They, they have broken a lot of harm for us, because I think it was very difficult to control, to check up the, the firing. You know, the fire chamber is more than two and a half meters high. Kilns like these are still used in the hinterlands of Alexandria today. They are lit once a week to fire all the pottery on hand. Clay was the universal material of antiquity. It was cheap, freely available, easy to shape and durable. As they did in ancient times, the men feed the fire and keep it burning all night long. Whether it was amphorae or water pipes, this early mass production of everyday items was one of the prerequisites for the development of large cities. Agnodiki's transformation is now complete. But will the deception work? The library of Alexandria, the goal of Agnodiki's dreams. Here, the greatest minds of her time teach and conduct research. Archimedes, Euclid, or Eratosthenes, who had discovered that the Earth was not flat, but a sphere. The library was renowned throughout the ancient world. 700,000 scrolls, the collected knowledge of antiquity, were stored here. The Ptolemies went to unusual lengths in their pursuit of knowledge. Every ship that docked in Alexandria had to hand over to the library all its written materials and received copies in return. A treasure trove of knowledge opens up before Agnodiki. No one here could know that not a single scroll will survive. The library and its treasures were destroyed by fire in the third century AD. However, there is one place where papyrus scrolls from that time have been preserved. Teptunis, at the edge of the desert. For the past 20 years, a French-Italian team has been excavating the remains of a Ptolemaic city here. What in Alexandria is hidden beneath numerous layers of history, here lies directly under the desert sand. The extraordinary feature of Teptunis is not the ruins. The extremely dry desert climate has preserved thousands of written documents dating back to the founding of Alexandria. It is an El Dorado for the papyrus specialist Professor Galazzi who leads the dig. The papyrus uh, was used in old Egypt and also in Greece and in Europe. But uh, in Greece and in Europe it's uh, impossible to find papyri. Uh, as it's impossible to find papyri in Alexandria because the humidity destroyed all this kind of material. 
in this uh, small village, the sand, the desert, reserve all. For that, Papa, uh, Tep Tunis is uh, one of the rare places of the Egypt where it is possible yet now to find papyri and my mission find about uh, uh, 3,000 papyri. The discoveries made in Tep Tunis suggest what treasures must once have been stored in the library of Alexandria. These papyri already provide unrivaled insight into life in ancient times. All the papyri give uh, us a view of daily life. We have uh, the receipt or the taxes that uh, allow to note the name of uh, the owner of the building. We have uh, the account of uh, the food bought by the family. Sometimes we have uh, official acts of uh, burn or dead, uh, of marriage. We have a contract. So, if you join all this text, all this information, you can really have exact view of the life in this village 2,000 years ago. There were no libraries in the provinces. The Teptunis papyri come from private dwellings, offices or temples. With its geometric layout and its broad processional avenue, Teptunis has similarities to the capital, Alexandria. And as in Alexandria, there are signs of an intermingling of cultures. Greek columns deep in the Egyptian hinterland. This house may have been the home of a rich merchant who made his fortune by trading along the caravan routes. Even in Egypt, the Greeks of the Ptolemaic period retained their Greek lifestyle. They had a special temple dedicated to the god Hermes, and their daily lives in the desert were sweetened by luxurious public baths, which even boasted heated floors. The fragile papyri must be treated on site to ensure their preservation. After centuries in the sand, they reveal their long-held secrets to the scientists. The texts are written in Greek, but also in Demotic, the everyday Egyptian script. Papyrus, too, was a mass-produced product, much like modern notepaper. It was necessary to join together the sheets of papyrus and to form a roll of papyrus. Normally, a roll of uh, 20 sheets it was along about 3 meter 20 centimeter. And uh, when some person needed to use a small part of the papyrus, cut a part of the roll and use. Most of the Teb Tunis papyri record ordinary everyday events. Their sales contracts, tax notices or lease agreements. But the library of Alexandria housed the writings of all the great scholars of the time. There were works on mathematics, geometry and astronomy, as well as historical works, maps and pioneering medical treatises. All waiting for Agnadiki. But the library also guarded some secrets which were to be withheld from most people. The famous Dr. Herophilus taught in Alexandria. 
His unusual research methods were not meant to be publicly known. Driven by curiosity, Agnodike dares to mingle with the doctor's circle of students. Herophilus was the founder of modern anatomy. He gained his insights from the dissection of human cadavers. But even in the city of knowledge, such a practice was strictly taboo. To cut open a corpse instead of burying it with dignity was to go against the will of the gods. Prosecute. Agnodike is suddenly in great danger. If she is discovered, her survival is by no means certain. Professor Galazzi's discoveries generally shed light on matters that are less sensational, but in no way less human. This is uh, information concerning a priest meeting with uh, the date, the name of the person invited in the meeting, and the information that uh, the member of the association and the person that uh, was invited in the meeting drink some beer. The face of Alexandria has changed many times since its founding. The Greeks were succeeded by the Romans. Then the Arabs ruled the city for a time. In the 1920s, the ancient metropolis took on a Mediterranean look. Nowadays, progress has arrived in the form of newly constructed office buildings on historic soil. Dr. Empereur's team is on its way to yet another rescue dig. A modern shopping mall is being built. To save time, and against all agreements, the developer has buried half the excavation site under a concrete slab overnight. The archaeologists have little time to explore the area still accessible. And yet, it was here that they made a significant discovery. In a pile of rubble, they came across the torso of a marble statue. The precious find has been examined and treated in the research center's workshops. Much to the team's surprise, it turned out to be the marble statue of a Roman emperor. Alexandria had been the queen of the ancient capitals for 300 years when a new metropolis rose to power across the sea. Rome seized control over the entire Mediterranean region. In 31 BC, the Romans subjugated the realm of the Ptolemies. They changed the Greek city radically by building their own on top of it and imposed their culture on Alexandria. This showy Roman boulevard was built directly over a Ptolemaic residential area. Unlike the Greeks, the Romans took the country by force. The intermingling of cultures ended abruptly. The Romans would tolerate no other rulers. They reduced the glittering metropolis to a provincial town in their empire. Music 
Agnodiki's plan has failed. She must return to Athens. But fate gives her story an unexpected twist. At the lighthouse construction site, part of the scaffolding has collapsed and buried some laborers working for Krates. He too has been injured. The accident at the lighthouse gives Agnodiki the opportunity to demonstrate her competence. Her help is valued in this hour of need. Agnodiki will be allowed to stay in Alexandria and finish her studies. As a woman with the same rights as male students. The story is told that she returned to Athens and worked successfully as a doctor for many years. Alexandria's heyday under Ptolemaic rule lasted only 300 years. It was the Ptolemies who transformed Alexander the Great's vision into reality. They made Alexandria the cultural center of the ancient world and a stronghold of knowledge and the sciences. Alexandria was also antiquity's most modern city with a perfect infrastructure, incomparable buildings, and unique technological achievements. Alexandria was far ahead of its time. Not until the modern period did city planners again dare to attempt such immense urban projects. Over 2,000 years ago, the first great European capital cities rose around the shores of the Mediterranean. More and more people lived in increasingly crowded conditions. The arts, commerce and sciences flourished. Struggling for power and influence, these cities tried to outshine each other by erecting magnificent buildings. People from different cultures and parts of the world were drawn to these cities seeking prosperity and happiness. On the coast of North Africa, once stood the fabled city of Carthage, a city of merchants and traders and home to one of the greatest seafaring peoples of all time. Beginning in the 12th century BC, the Phoenicians, forefathers of the Carthaginians, came from the east by ship and gradually settled all along the North African coast. 
Their thirst for adventure and their spirit of exploration are legendary. They sailed around Africa, and some say they even reached the Americas. The port of Carthage in 180 BC. This is where the story of Margot begins. He's about to embark on a dangerous voyage that will decide his future. It is also the story of the wealth of Carthage and the merchants who ruled over the Mediterranean. A story of slavery and freedom and the power of love, money and the gods. And the story of a city whose success and good fortune inspired envy and hatred. Where Carthage once stood, there are now fashionable villas. Carthage has become a suburb of Tunis. Nothing testifies to the former might of the city. Tunis is a city of contrasts. Here, Africa meets Europe. The present collides with the past. Modern Tunis is the capital of Tunisia, but there is no way it can rival the importance of ancient Carthage. That city was the hub of Mediterranean trade and a meeting place for people from all over the world. Carthage was the New York of the ancient world. In 814 BC, Phoenician seafarers and merchants founded Punic Carthage as a trading outpost. From here, they could control all of the Western Mediterranean. The port of Carthage attracted shipping from the entire Mediterranean region. Outside the city gates stands a Roman aqueduct. It carried water 130 kilometers from the Atlas Mountains to the new city that the Romans built centuries later on the ruins of Punic Carthage. The settlers then were veterans of the Roman legions, rewarded for their years of service with parcels of land. Visible from afar, the huge aqueduct demonstrated Rome's claim to North Africa. It shows the special significance of this region throughout history. The water also supplied the great Roman baths, one of the city's meeting places. The size of the baths testifies to the city's former greatness and to the luxury its people enjoyed. Roman Carthage was a center of trade and the main port in North Africa. And it provided Rome with wheat from the hinterlands. From Carthage, the Romans ruled their lands in Africa. But long before the Romans arrived, this was home to the Carthaginians. Few traces of them have survived. Professor Fethi Shelby has been trying for years to uncover the secrets of the Punic Carthaginians. His excavations reveal little of the city's daily life, but they are eloquent about its horrific demise. On retrouve ces traces, les vestiges de ce, ce grand, de cette catastrophe dans les fouilles de la couche de 146 de destruction, qui sont des couches noires de cendres, de poutres qui ont brûlé. Il y a du, dans, on rencontre du, dans ces fouilles des plans fendus, des, des, des armes, des jablots, des cadavres, euh, des crânes fendus, euh, des, toutes sortes de, de témoignages de cette euh, épouvantable bataille qui s'est déroulée ici sur, euh, sur cette colline. 
et qui ont sonné le glas de la, de la Carthage punique. Among the most important and most mysterious remains of culture are the stele. They are stone pillars that were erected on holy sites and burial grounds. They bear puzzling signs and inscriptions. Thousands of stele are kept in the storerooms of the National Museum of Carthage. For Fatih Shelby, they are priceless evidence of a distant past. They are more than 2,000 years old. The unique script is a direct precursor of the Greek and Latin alphabets. Phoenician seafarers brought this alphabet to Carthage from their homeland. Many a sailor about to embark on a long and dangerous journey would pray for help and dedicate a stela to Tanit, the goddess of Carthage, signs of whose presence were throughout the city. The skeleton of a young Punic man was found in one of the mausoleums of old Carthage. He lived 2,200 years ago. His bones show no sign of the malnutrition that was common among sailors. He was well-fed, healthy, and strong. In the laboratory of the National Museum of Carthage, anthropologist Sihem Rudisli attempts to coax his story from these bones. Perhaps this man was one of the city's many merchants. The trading port was the heart of the city and a marketplace for goods from all over the world. People here could buy daily necessities and precious goods from distant lands. Anything was possible in Carthage. You could get rich if you were clever or bold. Margot will navigate a ship sailing into the Atlantic and down the coast of Africa looking for new mineral deposits. With the help of the gods, Margot hopes to add to the city's fame and wealth. If he succeeds, he'll finally be able to marry Biriklit. The sea was full of dangers. Many set sail never to be seen again. Even if you could steer clear of the shallows and weather the storms, there were still pirates and slave traders to contend with. Margot's family could have lived here. These dwellings were built several stories high and were crowded tightly together. If Margot had grown up here, he would have played in these alleys and, like many boys of his age, dreamed of becoming as famous a seafarer as the great admiral Hanno. In the 6th century BC, Hanno had sailed through the Straits of Gibraltar and steered south along the west coast of Africa in search of new sources of tin and gold. Whether or not he succeeded has not come down to us, but he saw mountains spitting out fire and giant hairy creatures. As proof, he brought back a gorilla skin. Ici, nous sommes dans une maison punique qui date du début du deuxième siècle avant Jésus-Christ. C'est-à-dire que cette maison, euh, en fait, a euh, 2300 ans. Et cette maison fait partie donc de la, de la ville de Carthage à cette époque qui pouvait compter plusieurs centaines de, de, de personnes. 
de milliers de personnes, plusieurs centaines de milliers de personnes. Et euh, cette maison euh, est, a été construite selon un type de type oriental. The climate requires a particular style of architecture. The old quarter of Tunis today may not look much different from ancient Carthage. Dutch archaeologist Royal Doctor is interested in the everyday life of the ancient trading city. How was Punic Carthage organized? First, he must get an idea of the city's layout. He's trying to find the ancient city walls. Many before him have searched in vain. There should be clues on the plans of previous excavations. Streets which abruptly changed direction for no apparent reason may have done so because they ran into the ancient city walls. This is where he hopes to find them. Here, archaeologists have already dug 10 meters down into the history of Carthage. These steps take royal doctor past the Byzantine and Roman eras down into the remains of the Punic city. Are these stones from Carthage's old city walls? They were built to protect the inhabitants from raids by North African tribes. At the peak of Carthage's power, over 100,000 people lived here. They all needed food and water. There was no river nor adequate springs of drinkable water inside the city walls. Carthaginian builders came up with a simple yet ingenious solution. The economy of water at the time Punic was really admirable. At Carthage, we found thousands of cisterns. Each house had its own cisterns. These cisterns are very deep, straight and longed et elles sont recouvertes d'un enduit étanche qui est très résistant et excellent, qui, ce qui a permis de les conserver. Et ces citernes étaient approvisionnées par une adduction d'eau qui provenait de la terrasse grâce à des tuyaux en terre cuite. Unlike the Romans, the Carthaginians had no aqueducts. Perhaps they worried that they could easily be destroyed during a war. The Carthaginians used cisterns giving them a secure water supply even during a siege. The heavy winter rains filled cisterns throughout the city. Carthage of old was home to 100,000 people, a true metropolis for its day, and all those people had to be fed. The marketplace then would have looked much like this one in the old center of Tunis. Carthaginian fishermen sold their catch here. Animals for slaughter came from the surrounding area. Many city dwellers would have kept poultry to feed their family. The region was fertile. A Punic treatise on agriculture has survived. The Romans found it so important that they even translated it into Latin. The ancient Punic seafarers also knew about agriculture. They waited out the stormy winter months on land, sowing the grain that would become their provisions on board. Grain and bread were their principal foods. A woman bending over an oven watched by her child as she bakes bread. But above all, Carthaginians were sustained by the sea, by fishing and trade. The sea was their true homeland and the source of their prosperity. Their merchant ships were protected by the Carthaginian navy. Its galleys were famed and feared. If you could have looked down on the ancient city, 
you'd have seen an unusual circular structure. It was the naval port, Carthage's best kept secret. All that's left are a few remnants of the walls and the port's circular basin. Greek and Roman historians wrote awestruck accounts of the naval port. They claimed that it could disgorge entire fleets in an instant. The Romans realized that they would have to discover the port's secret if they wanted to conquer Carthage. Ce port était un endroit très secret. Comme il y avait plusieurs et beaucoup d'étrangers qui étaient à Carthage, les Carthaginois l'avaient entouré d'un grand mur pour empêcher que les regards indiscrets ne voient ce qui se passait dedans. Ils ne pouvaient compter, par exemple, le nombre de navires qui étaient ici en, en réparation. C'était donc un endroit particulièrement protégé et secret de la ville. The island in the center of the port was the seat of the Admiralty. This was the driving force behind Carthaginian sea power that dominated the Mediterranean. Carthage's warships protected the shipping routes and commercial outposts. The navy was commanded from the city, but the ships acted independently at sea. Carthaginian power came from the experience of the rowing crews and the navigational skills of the captains. They gave it their all, as the punishment for failure could be crucifixion. The captains regularly returned to the home port for repairs to damaged ships. Ce port, on pouvait mettre à l'abri plus de 220 navires. Il y avait tout autour de l'îlot de la Mirauté ici, et ainsi que tout autour du port, des cales dans lesquelles on pouvait tirer les bateaux pour les réparer. Archaeologists have excavated one of the ramps from which ships could be launched at such frightening speed. But that was only one of the secrets of this ingeniously designed port. Hidden behind the rectangular commercial port was the circular naval port. It was not visible from the sea, and the entrance was also gated. So to anyone watching, the Carthaginian warships seemed to vanish into thin air whenever they entered port. Margot has been at sea for months. Every day, Biriklit watches anxiously for his ship. He should have returned from his voyage long ago. The town of Calibia. Here too, life depends on the sea and the treasures brought home by its seafarers. Calibia was a Punic settlement and, like Carthage, was destroyed by the Romans. The land and sea are unchanged, but today people travel by plane and most goods are transported by large freighters. All the same, Calibia is still an important port providing many people with their livelihood. Early in the morning, fishermen gather in the cafe after selling their catch. Directly next to the fishing harbor is the shipyard. Here they still build ships out of wood. In ancient times, they were made from the cedars that grew in Lebanon, home of the Phoenicians. They were the ancestors of the Punic Carthaginians. Over 3,000 years ago, they built the first seaworthy vessels and set out to explore the Mediterranean.
They were masters of their materials and produced ships that defied wind and waves. The Phoenicians were nomads of the sea. They came from the royal city-state of Tyre, on the coast of present-day Lebanon, and sailed west, establishing trading outposts all along the African coast. Thanks to its strategic position, Carthage grew steadily in importance, eventually overshadowing all other Phoenician settlements, both militarily and commercially. There were merchants, there were marines, and the Carthaginois negotiations are very famous. They were exactly as famous as the Phoenicians, Qui, qui sont connus par, connus par tous les, les textes de l'Antiquité. Carthage était, n'oublions pas, une puissance commerciale de premier ordre. One of the Carthaginian strong points was their ability to absorb the influence of foreign cultures. The few surviving sculptures show unmistakable Greek and Egyptian traits. The Carthaginians were open to new ideas a characteristic that explains their enormous success as a trading nation. In a safe, Sihem Rudesli keeps a handful of treasures. They survived both the Roman soldiers and the grave robbers of later centuries. Jewelry is the most intimate evidence of a long vanished past. Les bijoux puniques sont d'une rareté, d'une finesse introuvable de nos jours. Ce sont des bijoux qui ont été portés par des femmes riches, puniques, les bijoux avec des, avec des médaillons portant des statuettes en faïence, des boucles d'oreilles qui sont lourdes, bien travaillées. Il y a de la recherche dans la technique de la fabrication. Ces boucles d'oreilles, elles sont lourdes, elles ne peuvent pas être suspendues à l'oreille, mais elles peuvent être suspendues par l'intermédiaire d'un cordonné. Les femmes riches portaient des bijoux avec des exigences. So the bijoutiers adapted to this exigence of the femme riche punique. The gold is evidence of the wealth of punic settlements and cities. Kirkwan. This punic city on the sea east of Carthage was also destroyed by the Romans. It is puzzling that unlike other cities, Kerkwan was not built over by the Romans. But for this reason, it provides a unique opportunity to learn more about the structure of a Punic city and the structure of Punic society. Helicopters are not allowed to fly here, so Frenchman Alain Arnoux flew over the site on a motorized paraglider. The pictures he has taken are unique. From above, a remarkably regular layout is revealed. The houses are small, there are no palaces or monumental buildings, no remnants of grand statues, no memorials to kings or generals, no triumphal arches glorifying grand deeds. Who ruled this city? There were no kings in either Kerkouan or Carthage. Government in Carthage lay in the hands of the Suffites two merchants nominated from their own ranks as representatives for a limited period. This system prevented striving for personal power. We know also by the institutions Carthaginois that there were, of course, the suffets, the chiefs of the politics of Carthage. There were also... Des prêtres 
qui s'est donné au culte de toutes les divinités dont on, a, dont on, parle, on en a parlé. Et euh, ces prêtres sont évoqués aussi sur des, euh, à la fois sur les stèles votives du Tophet, mais aussi sur des stèles funéraires. Donc il y avait, c'était une société, société très complexe, où, qui euh, était composée de plusieurs corps de métiers. A kind of democracy seems to have been practiced in Punic society. The form of the Carthaginian state was even admired by the Greeks, the inventors of democracy. We know much about the city's management and the structure of Punic society from the stele. They are an important source of information. The short inscriptions are mostly appeals to the gods. The donors are also identified by name and profession. It was only the wealthy who could afford to commission Steely. They never mentioned the city's poor or its slaves. No city in antiquity could have functioned without slaves. Their muscles were the engines of the ancient world. Anyone could become a slave through poverty, but also by being kidnapped or taken prisoner of war. Margot's ship has been seized by pirates. Oh my God! No, more leave alone! You are not me! Oh, you are the devil! Very good! Very good! He has survived the attack, but has been sold to a slave trader. Instead of returning home laden with riches, the once free man has become a slave without any rights, abandoned by the gods. Where will Margot be taken? Cap Bon, French for the good cape. In ancient times, this was a fateful place, full of terror and immense suffering. Here, slaves and condemned criminals hewed the blocks of stone with which Carthage was built. Fifteen meters underground, there is an extensive network of caves carved out by the slaves. The traces of their chisels can still be seen on the walls. The cave served as both quarry and prison. A man who was a slave in the quarries at Cap Bon had forfeited his life. Margot knows full well that he is at the mercy of the guards and that he will only leave the caves as a dead man. Yet only a day's journey separates Margot from freedom and his old life. For ships leave here every day with stone for the walls of Carthage. Roll Doctor's quest has paid off. He and his assistants have succeeded in uncovering the remains of the Punic city wall. It was a wall of massive proportions. 
3,90 Meter. Okay, merci. Diese Mauer äh, ist tatsächlich gefunden worden und besteht aus zwei Schalen, zwei Mauerschalen mit Verstrebung dazwischen, die äh, eine Mächtigkeit haben von 4,80 Meter, äh, 4,60 Meter, 4,80 Meter und eine riesige Stadtmauer. The wall doctor has found served as a line of defense, but in quite a modern way, it also divided the city into different spheres, into residential and commercial districts. The dirty, smelly industries, such as tanneries and metal fabrication, were relegated to a position outside the city walls. A whole industrial district developed there. Im Industrieviertel Kataros haben wir eine riesige Menge von solchen Blasebalgdüsen gefunden, die äh, im Ofen st äh, steckten und wodurch die äh, Luft geblasen wurde, um das, äh, die Hitze äh, zu, zu steigern. Und äh, gerade an diesen Blasebalgdüsen hat man im Labor in Amsterdam einige Beobachtungen gemacht, äh, nämlich festgestellt, dass in dem Teil, das im Ofen steckte, ein sehr hohes Anteil an Kalk drin war. Und das äh, würde bedeuten, dass da im Brennverfahren, also in der Eisenverarbeitung, äh, Kalk zugemischt wurde, um äh, die Verunreinigung zu neutralisieren. It was only in modern times that calcium was again used to produce high quality steel. Could the Carthaginians have discovered this process 2000 years ago? Along with other investigative methods, analyses by computer tomography in Amsterdam may provide an answer. CAT scans produce sectional views of the nozzles and reveal the Carthaginians' wide-ranging expertise in metallurgy. Das ist nicht zufällig, dass das so zustande gekommen ist, aber man hat auch die Elemente ausgewählt. Man hat die, das Calcium hat man zugeschlagen, ganz spezifisch, und man hat isolierende Materialien verwendet, ganz spezifisch, ganz ausgewählte Sandschichten, ganz sa äh, saubere Sandschichten mit ganz bestimmter Korngröße, äh, die isolierend funktionieren und die also äh, Brennstoff sparen. The images confirm the bold hypothesis. The Carthaginians actually did develop a multi-phase process for manufacturing high-quality iron. This process was only rediscovered in the 19th century, at the start of the Industrial Revolution. In one of the nozzles, the scientists even discover a valve for directing the flow of air. Damit wissen wir, dass die ein wirklich ein hochwertiges Produkt äh, anzubieten hatten, das auf ein industrielles Niveau äh, angefertigt wurde, auf eine große Ebene. Da muss viel produziert sein, mehr als wahrscheinlich die Stadtbevölkerung selbst brauchte. Und wir können davon ausgehen, dass das auch äh, vermarktet wurde, dass man diese Produkte äh, exportierte. Man kann dann denken an Waffen, aber auch Schiffs. Ausrüstungen und so weiter und so weiter. Carthaginian iron was good, but over time even the best iron crumbles into rust. Not so this well-preserved handle in bronze, an amalgam of copper and tin. There are no tin deposits in all of North Africa, and this was an important raw material. Tin, for example, came from the British Isles. Carthaginians controlled the trade of this and other metals and kept their sources secret. They even forged their travel logs to mislead rivals. The bronze casters of Carthage were masters of their craft and created objects of great beauty. The city's artisans produced whatever took the fancy of their customers, including copies of foreign artifacts. In the souks of Tunis, artisans still work as they did some 2,000 years ago, without machines, preserving skills from antiquity. 
Small workshops like this also existed in Carthage, but even then there must have been big manufacturers producing goods intended for export. Artisans, ship owners, captains and merchants with their extensive trade connections all contributed to the general prosperity. There was also the trade in Tyrian purple, a dye made from sea snails, which was held dearer than gold. The purple dye was as famous as the proverbial business acumen of the city's merchants. Carthaginian merchants were respected even in Rome. Later, Pliny the Elder would call their Phoenician ancestors the inventors of trade. Margo knows that his own family is too poor to buy his freedom. Griclit is Margo's only hope. And Griclit's last hope is Naba, a rich uncle. He has the power and the money to find Margo and free him for her. <laughs> The path to Margot leads through the slave market. Who bought him? Where is he now? How much will it cost to free him? Can Naba's gold open the door to Margot's freedom? Four to five days' journey inland from Carthage once stood the city of Duga, an important stop on the caravan route into the continent's interior. From the heart of Africa came slaves, ivory and gold. These ruins are from a later date. As in Carthage, the Romans built a new city on top of the ruins of a Punic settlement. Archaeologists from Freiburg in Germany are searching for traces of Punic Duga beneath the Roman layer. Über diese Frühzeit wissen wir bisher in Duga sehr wenig. Wir haben monumentale Grabtürme, die von einem hohen Wohlstand dieser mächtigen einheimischen Familien zeugen. Wir haben Inschriften, aber wir wissen nichts über die Siedlungsgeschichte dieser Zeit. Und das ist der Grund, weshalb wir dort unten auf einem größeren Areal eben in diese frühen Siedlungsschichten vorstoßen. The archaeologists have found the walls of a district of artisans' workshops from Punic times. Most of the amphora shards found here were produced locally, but from time to time, Shards of Roman amphoras are unearthed. Through Carthage, Duga was linked to the Mediterranean trade routes. What lured the Carthaginians into the interior of the continent? Was die Punia hier hergetrieben hat, war offensichtlich die Fruchtbarkeit dieser Gegend, in der dann später zum Teil auch wahrscheinlich schon in der Frühzeit Wein, Öl und dann auch Getreide produziert wurde. Duga war verkehrsmäßig gut zu erreichen durch dieses Tal des Wet Calet, durch dieses fruchtbare Tal und liegt eben auch in einer strategisch ausgesprochen günstigen Position auf diesem Hügelkamm mit Steilfelsen auf zwei Seiten, also gut zu verteidigen und die Stadt verfügte über Baumaterial, das man gleich vor Ort abbauen konnte. These were good conditions for a city, and so Duga became an important center. The Punic Numidian ruler Massinissa had a majestic mausoleum constructed here, a sign of the region's wealth. For a time, Massinissa was an ally of Carthage, but in a struggle for power, he switched to the Roman side.
كثير حتي بدي اه ترو ماني ماستر يا عثمان a roman coin a few years before the destruction of carthage in 146 bc more and more such coins appeared in duga an indication that the romans had succeeded in winning over duga to their side The Romans fought with weapons and with the power of the word. They spread rumors that the Carthaginians sacrificed their children to the gods here at the sanctuary known as the Tophet. Was the Tophet the site of such bloody rituals? Have archaeologists found evidence of child sacrifice, or was it merely clever Roman propaganda? Thousands of urns have, in fact, been found beneath the stele. They contain the ashes and charred bones of sacrificial animals and those of children. For some researchers, this is evidence of bloody human sacrifice. But for Professor Shelby, it is far from being proof. Depuis un certain nombre d'années, on croit plutôt que le Tophet était une sorte de cimetière d'enfants. Et cela à cause de, des analyses, du résultat des analyses qui ont été faites à partir des cendres trouvées dans les urnes. On s'est rendu compte que ces cendres appartenaient à des fœtus ou à des enfants morts-nés. Ensuite, on s'est souvenu qu'à Carthage, les tombes d'enfants sont plutôt rares, alors qu'il y avait une très forte mortalité. Donc, probablement ici, en présence d'une d'un cimetière d'un type un peu spécial, où l'on présentait les enfants qui étaient déjà morts, on les rendait aux divinités de Carthage, Baalamon et Athanite. And yet, child sacrifice cannot be ruled out entirely. It was known in other ancient cultures. Perhaps Carthage resorted to human as well as to animal sacrifice to appease the gods in hard times. Giriklit's efforts have released Margot from slavery. Now he is being taken back into the company of free men. The priest prays to Tanit, imploring her to support and favor Margot. However pragmatic the Carthaginians may have been in daily life, religion was very important to them. These are burial chambers of rich Carthaginians. Here, various burial objects have been found, small figurines, oil lamps, sacrificial vessels. Les caveaux puniques et leur contenu permettent d'étudier l'eschatologie punique. Les puniques croyaient en une vie après la mort. Ils croyaient aussi en l'âme. Pour eux, l'âme après la mort, quand elle quittait le corps, elle devait entreprendre un long voyage. On la représente souvent partant de la ville des vivants vers la ville des morts. The necropolis at Kerkwan outside the city proper. The Carthaginians cut their graves out of solid rock. The graves were already robbed in antiquity, but the scattered bones of Carthaginians can still be found here.
The walls of the burial chambers are decorated with images reflecting their religious beliefs. A cockerel drawn in purple. The cockerel is known in Egyptian mythology as the symbol of the soul, the breath of life. It is on its way to the city of souls, which closely resembles a Punic city. Gods and spirits dominated the daily life of Carthaginians. The god Baal Hammon was the patron of Carthage and the guarantor of success and happiness. And signs of his consort, Tanit, goddess of fertility and prosperity. The priest leaves Margot purified and strengthened. Condemned to slavery after a shipwreck, Margot can once again take his place as a free citizen of Carthage. Oh my God. Bahad Sahli. Yo, Abi. They hope that with Tanit's protection, he will return safely from new voyages to distant lands. Hello, Bait Halunu, Ayon. Mahanot, Atsiv Lahsu, Begam Atufam Hat. O Alonim. Two sarcophagi in the Carthage Museum. Perhaps they belong to a rich merchant and his wife, such as Margot and Biriklit. In Rome, the die is cast. Carthage must be destroyed. The Roman Empire equips a huge war fleet and sends its legions across the sea to Africa. In the spring of 146 BC, the decisive blow is struck and the city stormed. Dreadful scenes took place in these streets. The soldiers of Rome have flown from the du port en gravissant les pentes de la colline vers la citadelle. Et en cours de route, ils ont détruit toutes les maisons qui, euh, qu avaient tra tous les quartiers qu'ils avaient traversés. C'est une, c'était un mouvement dévastateur. Des, des maisons ont, se sont, ont été éventrées, se sont effondrées. Euh, la grande partie de la population a péri sous les décombres et dans les flammes. The Romans razed Carthage to the ground and cursed the city for all eternity. Never again would people live here. How immense must have been their hate. Or was it fear? And yet, just 100 years after the sack of Carthage, the Romans themselves built a city on these ruins. It was to become the capital of the Roman province of Africa. It was Carthage's extraordinary commercial success that had so enraged the Romans. Only after Rome had annihilated her rival and arch enemy could she rise to greatness. And so the destruction of Carthage has entered history as one of mankind's greatest tragedies. Carthage became a memorial and a legend, a magical place that has cast its spell on people throughout the ages. Over 2,000 years ago, the first great European capital cities rose around the shores of the Mediterranean. More and more people lived in increasingly crowded conditions. The arts, commerce and sciences flourished. Struggling for power and influence, 
These cities tried to outshine each other by erecting magnificent buildings. People from different cultures and parts of the world were drawn to these cities, seeking prosperity and happiness. Rome. During the second century AD, the Roman Empire was at its height, and the city held a million inhabitants. No city was richer, more powerful, or more ruthless, and none was so bloodthirsty. Monumental buildings testified to the power and greatness of the Roman Empire. Rome was the center of the ancient world. Rome, the eternal city with its eternal chaos. Even 2,000 years ago, the Romans complained about the noise and the traffic. Ox carts were prohibited from driving through the city during the day. Instead, they robbed people of sleep at night. The Colosseum was the largest arena of its time and could hold 50,000 spectators. When it was inaugurated in 80 AD, the festivities ran for 100 days. During the festival, 52,000 gladiators lost their lives. They demonstrated to people and emperor alike that only courage in the face of death would make you truly great and victorious. The capital of the Roman Empire was also the capital of crime. Murder, manslaughter and fraud were everyday events. On the streets of Rome, Drusus, captain of the city cohort is in charge of law and order. He pursues murderers and thieves and unscrupulous traders such as Petronius, who are not above shady deals. To capture a crook like Petronius, Drusus slips into the Roman underworld. Harsh punishment awaits anyone who cheats the emperor. Right next to the Colosseum, archaeologists are excavating Imperial Rome. They are not interested in palaces and villas, but in simple buildings, the Rome of ordinary people such as Drusus and Petronius. These sites have been excavated before, but as the ruins held neither marble statues nor rich murals, the archaeologists weren't very interested and the sites were filled in again. But these days, Excavations have a different purpose. Archaeologists are trying to understand how people lived at the time. Gradually, the finds are pieced together to form a picture of everyday life, which was amazingly like life in a big modern city. You have to look closely at the pieces to coax their story from them. This necklace is not made of precious jewels. It's simple costume jewelry. Perhaps it was a young man's gift to his beloved. German archaeologist Richard Neudecker is looking for signs of everyday life in antiquity. He's interested in these buildings, the insulae, the world's first large tenement blocks. 
They were four to seven stories high, some even higher. Living space was at a premium in Rome. Neudecker knows how this city once looked, what happened on its squares and in its alleys. Modern Rome was built on the debris of millennia. What was once the ground floor of this ancient tenement block now lies eight meters below ground. These rooms are almost 2,000 years old. They housed people who had come to Rome to seek their fortune. Alle Welt strebt nach Rom aus verschiedensten Gründen. Es gab natürlich angehende Dichter, Künstler, die in Rom Karriere machen wollten. Es gab aber auch die ganz große Schar der Armen aus Italien hauptsächlich, die gar keine andere Chance hatten, als in der Großstadt eine Arbeit zu finden, als Tagelöhner zu arbeiten, irgendwo reinzurutschen, ein Auskommen zu finden von Tag zu Tag. Diese Möglichkeit hatte man auf dem Lande nicht. The lack of living space and the price of land forced people to live in narrow, cramped houses. They were dark and noisy and stank horribly. But the tenants were still forced to pay exorbitant rents. Mit Miete, mit Wohnungsbau war viel Geld zu machen. Es gab die Immobilienfirmen, die diese Gebäude schnell und billig errichteten, ohne auf Bauqualität zu achten. Es wurden hohe Mieten kassiert. Die Risse in den Wänden wurden nicht repariert, wurden übertüncht und die Häuser stürzten sehr schnell ein. Für die Bauunternehmer war es kein großer Verlust, denn das Material war alles wieder zu verwenden, es war schnell wieder hochgezogen und die Mieteinnahmen flossen wieder. The poor had to share accommodation with strangers. Communities forged of necessity. The cityscape of ancient Rome had many such high-rise tenement blocks, separated by narrow alleys. This is the beat for Drusus and the men of the city cohort. They are Rome's policemen, respected and feared. Drusus is heading for the market at Trajan's Forum. An informer has revealed that one of the traders has been watering the wine, which is routine, but has also been cheating on the tax owed to the emperor. Drusus intends to find this villain and send him to the Colosseum as lion fodder. The history of Rome is written in blood. Legend has it that the city began with a crime, with the murder of a man by his brother. On the banks of the river Tiber, Rome was founded in 753 BC, says the legend. The tale begins with the Trojan hero Aeneas. His two descendants, Romulus and Remus, were abandoned on the banks of the river. The twins would have starved to death if they had not been adopted by a she-wolf. Later they quarreled over founding a city. Romulus killed his brother and named the new settlement after himself. In fact, Rome began as an Etruscan peasant village. The village grew to become the capital of a huge empire, extending from Britain to North Africa, from the Atlantic Ocean to the Black Sea. Wherever the Roman legions went, Roman builders erected splendid cities. Here, the elite of the conquered land, copying their Roman masters, lived in affluence. But in the city of Rome itself, everything was bigger and more impressive. The imperial palaces on the Palatine Hill, here life passed in luxury and extravagance. The Roman lifestyle set the example for the entire empire. 
But how could Rome afford all this? These shards reveal how Rome financed all this extravagant luxury. Rome was known as the city of the seven hills. Monte Testaccio was Rome's eighth hill. Jose Remasal has found it a rewarding excavation site for himself and his group of archaeologists. Rome produced prodigious quantities of waste. Monte Testaccio was nothing more than a gigantic tip. For the archaeologists, it's nothing but shards all the way down. In antiquity, millions of shattered amphoras were dumped here over a long period. With the contents of these amphoras, the provinces paid their tribute to the emperor. The vessels were filled with the provisions needed to feed the million people then living in Rome. The shards tell the history of Roman trade and of the tributes from the provinces and how the capital was supplied with food. Per il nostro lavoro eh, questo posto è molto importante perché qui si trovano queste anfore che mantengono ancora eh, le iscrizioni per dire alla moderna le etichette che hanno portato, cioè indicazione scritta con informazione molto complessa, sia la informazione del peso a vuoto del vaso, il peso del contenuto, il nome del commerciante, il controllo fiscale, il controllo che ha fatto lo Stato sul trasporto di questo materiale, che anche con la datazione consolare. Cioè abbiamo informazione precisa di chi ha portato queste anfora, di dove sono venute e in che anno. The archaeologists are working on a huge puzzle. The shapes of the fragments and their inscriptions reveal that most of the amphoras contained olive oil from the province of Hispania Baetica in southern Spain, today's Andalusia. Not far from Monte Testaccio were Rome's docks on the Tiber. Here, the amphoras were unloaded from cargo vessels. Directly behind the docks was the quarter where this endless stream of goods was stored. Some of the warehouses are still standing today, squeezed into the narrow space between the Tiber and modern Rome. The area is not open to the public, but Jose Remasal knows its importance. This is what remains of a vast trade center, which once supplied the city with all manner of goods. In these vaults, wholesalers stored grain, oil and wine and other commodities. Roma è una città molto grande nell'antichità, ma che si trova a una trentina di chilometri del mare. Dal mare, tramite il Tevere, sono stati portati e tutti i prodotti fino a qua e qua sono i grandi magazzini che, dove è stato depositato e scaricato tutto quello materiale per vetovagliare tutta la città di Roma, prodotti che venivano da tutte le regioni dell'impero romano, dall'Oriente fino all'Occidente, dalla Siria fino alla Spagna, dalla Inghilterra fino all'Egitto. From Spain came the popular garum which most of us would find a bit on the nose. It was a fermented fish sauce that served as a spice for many Roman dishes. Workers repacked this expensive delicacy into smaller vessels for the retail trade. Wine amphoras were used over and over, but amphoras for oil were smashed. They would have been too hard to clean. This was very vivace, 
perché bisogna pensare che le navi che arrivano fino a qua erano piccole, cioè ave, dovevano essere tantissime navi che arrivavano ogni giorno di qua, qua erano scaricati con l'aiuto delle gru e i prodotti erano immagazzinati. Ma as trade and profits boomed, so did swindling, smuggling and fraud. These warehouses belong to Petronius. He deals in anything that can bring a profit, mostly oil and wine. But it's best not to ask too closely where he gets his goods. For some years now, Petronius has forced his clerk to fiddle the accounts and falsify documents. Petronius has no idea that Drusus is already closing in on him. Monte Testaccio is testimony to the fact that on rural estates, countless slaves worked till they dropped. Their labor enabled a small Roman upper class to lead the soft life. Roman tax officials rigorously controlled the flow of tax revenues. Most of what they recorded on wax tablets and sheets of papyrus has been lost forever. But valuable information about the tax system can be gained from Monte Testaccio's pottery shards. Questo monte è una mostra del potere di Roma. Viene considerato che tutte le anfore che sono state buttate qui sono la rappresentazione del potere di Roma, del tributo che hanno dovuto pagare le province. Anche, per esempio, al secolo XVIII è stato vietato di portare via i cocci di qua, perché alla fine sarebbe stato distrutto questo simbolo del potere di Roma. An elaborate network of roads connected the Roman provinces, but most of the tribute arrived by sea. Olive oil and fish sauce from Spain, wine and grain from Sicily and North Africa. The province's tribute kept Rome viable. Exact accounts were recorded. Tax officials marked every amphora with their seal. The contents of each amphora were carefully noted so that nothing could be pilfered. For a long time, Petronius has been a thorn in the centurion's flesh. But until now, Drusus has lacked proof. Now Drusus has definite information. Someone has denounced Petronius for failing to pay tax. The seals on the amphoras give him away. Petronius is caught red-handed. All he can do is flee. From Ostia, he could have left Rome forever. The city seaport was located 30 kilometers from the city gates. Docking at Ostia were ships from every corner of the Mediterranean. 
though some never reached their destination, as is shown by a sensational discovery in Pisa. Perhaps the port was already patrolled in antiquity, as it surely attracted anyone seeking to start a new life abroad. 2,000 years ago, Pisa was a Mediterranean port, just like Ostia. But today, Pisa is 10 kilometers inland. In 1998, construction workers discovered this Roman port during excavations for a new railway station. Pumps prevent the excavation site from flooding as the archaeologists have to work below groundwater level. The muddy ground kept the air away from the timbers, thus preserving entire Roman ships and their cargoes. This scavo um, fornisce molti molti dati in proposito ed è quello della quotidianità dei, della gente che viveva sulle navi dei, dei marinai. Sono soprattutto gli oggetti che queste persone utilizzavano che ehm, a mio parere sono molto importanti. Sono eh, gli zoccoli di legno, ehm, i cesti, l'abbigliamento di, di cuoio, eh, le spazzole che utilizzavano per pulire la nave e cose, cose di questo tipo. For the archaeologists, this discovery in Pisa was uniquely lucky. The conditions have rarely been so ideal for preserving materials such as wood that readily decay. Along with amphoras from the ship's cargo, the archaeologists discovered objects preserved in mud that had been found nowhere else. A piece of leather, perhaps from a sailor's kit. In the mud of the harbour, the archaeologists have begun to release the hull of another ship. They owe their discovery to a tragic accident. The ship must have reached port safely when it capsized and sank in a storm. In the boat's hold, the archaeologists found a brush, probably used by a young sailor to scrub the deck just before the storm hit. Once the ships have been cleaned, it's a race against time, as the timbers crumble when exposed to air. Engineers and archaeologists secure the hulls with a framework of steel. Through plastic pipes under a fiberglass covering, the wood is soaked with resin solution to preserve it. When this work is finished, the ships await transport to the museum workshops. Timbers and planks from the ships and the docks were also retrieved. Scarring indicates a ship may have rammed the dock in a storm and sunk before its cargo could be unloaded. È probabile che eh, nell'antichità, anche in, in età romana, sia stato tentato il recupero dei materiali che eh, sono naufragati nelle, insieme alle, alle barche. Però eh, io credo che eh, nel, il recupero dei materiali mh, sia stato reso molto difficile dal fatto che eh, le imbarcazioni, essendo naufragate per cause eh, naturali molto violente, sono state ricoperte dal fango e dai detriti e quindi <coughs> ripescare degli oggetti nel fango anche se esistevano delle figure in un certo senso professionali che recuperavano oh, i materiali eh, sott'acqua. Most tribute payments were brought to Rome in ships like these, the only way to transport such large loads. They delivered goods to all the big ports of the Roman Empire. The most important of these was Ostia, the port for Rome. But natural disaster must have overcome them. Their cargoes might have been intended for the market at Trajan's Forum in Rome.
Richard Neudecker believes that the market played a special role in Roman life. Emperor Trajan ordered the construction of a trading center in the year 110 AD. It was a project so huge that part of one of the city's hills even had to be removed. 150 shops offered Romans whatever their hearts desired. Fresh vegetables from the region, wheat from North Africa, spices from Asia, the finest tableware, expensive cosmetics, and precious jewelry from distant provinces. Das Publikum hier war sicher gemischt, aber es war doch zum größten Teil aus den höheren Kreisen der Bevölkerung zusammengesetzt. Es waren die besseren, die feineren Leute, die hier einkauften. Die bewegten sich hier aber nicht allein auf der Straße, sondern sie hatten immer eine Menge an Gefolgschaft um sich. Sie wurden entweder auf der Sänfte getragen, da gab es also die Sänftenträger. Sie hatten Leute um sich, Sklaven, die ihnen den Weg frei machten. Sie hatten ihre Klientel, das heißt die von ihnen abhängigen Personen um sich. Je mehr jemand um sich hatte, umso besser, umso eindrucksvoller war es. On the ground floor were the shops. Those at the front were open to the street, but were shut with boards at night. To prevent theft and burglary, the markets were patrolled by guards. Here, a better class of shopkeepers leased their premises. It was a desirable area for a store, so the rents were probably high. The upper stories housed offices of the city administration. Here, poor people could register for free food. However, only male Romans enjoyed this privilege. Other Romans, who did not have to worry about surviving from day to day, could apply to have the public water supply connected to their homes. Es war niemals nur ein Platz, an dem man Dinge erledigte, seine Steuern bezahlte, einkaufte und wieder ging, sondern es war ein äh, sozialer Treffpunkt, es war ein gesellschaftlicher Treffpunkt. Man wusste, wann, zu welcher Zeit dort andere zu treffen waren. Man ging vormittags hierher und äh, fand sich dann mit anderen mit Bekannten, Freunden und so weiter zusammen äh, und wickelte ganz bestimmt auch Geschäfte ganz anderer Art dort ab, Geschäfte, die er immer auf der Straße im Freien unter Zeugen abgewickelt wurden. Es war sehr wichtig, dass immer Zeugen dabei waren. Man hat nicht den Vertrag aufgesetzt und unterschrieben, sondern man hat Zeugen gebraucht, die Öffentlichkeit. Die Öffentlichkeit ist ganz entscheidend für das Soziale, das Politische, das Geschäftsleben Roms. Such public areas were always extremely important to Roman society, because life took place not indoors, but on the street. This was true of all Roman cities. A tragedy has preserved one of them in its entirety, Pompeii. Pompeii lies at the foot of Mount Vesuvius, one of the world's most dangerous and unpredictable volcanoes. No one knows when Vesuvius will erupt again, but three million people still live in the shadow of the volcano. British archaeologist Rick Jones came to Pompeii to research how a Roman city functioned in antiquity. Our Anglo-American project in Pompeii is trying to study how the city that was destroyed in AD 79 came to be like that. How the whole mix of big houses, of rich and poor, of medium-sized houses, of workshops and bars came to be created over a period of some several centuries, maybe five centuries, and to examine that within the space of one complete block of the city. Pompeii was a small city set in the countryside amid gardens and vineyards. Still, many aspects of day-to-day -day existence must have been similar to those in Rome, so Pompeii can serve as a model of life in every Roman city.
Pompeii is a time machine, which will take you on a journey into the Roman past. Nowhere else is the everyday life of ancient times so palpable. The city's last day was virtually frozen in mid-action. In the year 79 AD, Mount Vesuvius broke apart, spat fire, rained ashes, and obliterated the city. The colonnade of a luxurious villa. The head of this family ran a bakery. These millstones ground grain into fine, expensive flour or into coarse flour, considered good enough for the poor and the slaves. The stable, with the animals that turned the millstones. They perished in the hot and poisonous gases, as did all those who could not flee the city in time. Generations of archaeologists have excavated Pompeii, but there are still new discoveries to be made. With the help of more than 100 staff, Rick Jones is currently exploring a whole block of Pompeii. Their common goal is to reconstruct life as it once was in this ancient city. These are the remains of an evening meal at which wild boar was served. But only wealthy households had kitchens with their own stove. The poor bought their meals on the street or in cheap taverns. <laughs> there were hundreds of these taverns in ancient Rome. Congregating there were denizens of the underworld and those with nothing more to lose, least of all their good name. <laughs> Petronius cannot return home because the police are after him, so he has come here, believing he will be safe. Now Petronius has made enemies, but someone on the run from the city cohort can't afford to make enemies. Previous excavations in Pompeii concentrated primarily on its last day. But now, scientists are digging deeper to find out more about the ways the city evolved. The houses were continually rebuilt, changing over time like the people. The archaeologists are searching specifically for small items. The surgeon's house was first excavated in 1926. His surgical instruments were given to a museum long ago. Now the history of the building and the changes in society are being examined more closely. What we're finding is that the, the rich, in simple terms, got richer and the poor got poorer. We see a process by which the, um, the bigger houses got bigger, more luxurious, more well-appointed with mosaics and fountains, whereas the poor are squeezed into smaller spaces, into upstairs spaces, into tighter places all round, whether within the big house as the servants and slaves or within the bars. Below the street, archaeologists uncover a lead pipe which brought fresh spring water to public fountains and to some villas. 
but only wealthy households were connected to this water supply. The masses of slaves enjoyed none of the luxuries typical of the Roman lifestyle. Roman cities functioned because slaves did the heavy work and because Roman engineers devised technologies which made life more comfortable. The houses of the rich had running water, bathrooms and underfloor heating. But much greater demands were placed on builders and city planners in Rome than in Pompeii. People who lived in Rome suffered from the problems of any big city. The sheer scale of it is something that is only really paralleled in modern times. And so they had many of the problems of congestion, of expensive accommodation, of difficulties of sleeping at night because of the noise, all those things that, that were uh, would go with people being crammed together in a, in a tight urban space. Rome was greedy for water. Drinking water for private and public wells, water for decorative fountains in upper-class houses, and water for the numerous public baths. Eight aqueducts brought millions of litres of water into the city every day. The arch was a Roman invention, as was cement. It was these lightweight arches that made the aqueducts possible. But eventually, even the finest spring water ends its run as stinking sewage. The stench pervaded all of Rome, even the Forum Romanum. Here, there were temples honoring the gods. Here, the Senate conferred and created policies, and high society used to meet. At the Forum Romanum is the entrance to the city's underworld. Today is closed to tourists. The famous Cloaca Maxima. All of Rome's sewage, both the refuse and the human waste, flowed through here. More than 2,000 years ago, Rome already had a sewerage system. Nevertheless, large quantities of sewage and rubbish ended up in the streets. Back then, oil lamps burned in the niches of these dark tunnels. They provided a feeble light for the work of maintenance crews. The sewers frequently blocked and had to be cleaned regularly. 600 metres of the Coaca Maxima are still part of today's system. In spite of its aqueducts and sewerage system, Rome suffered from a lack of hygiene. Es war äh, nicht äh, so gesund in Rom zu leben. Das lag, äh, da mag man sich wundern, aber es lag sehr stark am Wasser. Denn die Aquädukte, die zahlreichen Aquädukte, versorgten natürlich nicht die kleinen Haushalte. Das normale Wasser, das man brauchte, das man trank, stammte aus dem Tiber. In den Tiber flossen auch die Kloaken. Das heißt, es war natürlich ein ständiger Teufelskreis. Krankheiten wie Typhus und so weiter waren sicher an der Tagesordnung. Und es kommt eine weitere Gefahrenquelle hinzu. Das war der Schmutz, der Dreck, der in der Staub, der in der Luft lag. Augenerkrankungen waren sehr, sehr häufig, sehr zahlreich. So the city's water supply was also a source of disease. This was centuries before organisms were known to cause disease, so people resorted to home remedies. Cabbage, for instance, was said to be a cure, even for cancer. Die durchschnittliche Lebenserwartung äh, wird meistens so bei knapp 30 Jahren angesetzt, bei Frauen entsprechend niedriger, weil Frauen sehr oft natürlich bei der Geburt starben. Äh, das sagt natürlich nicht viel aus, das heißt nicht, dass man, wenn man die 30 erreicht hatte, automatisch damit rechnen muss. Das heißt nur, dass natürlich sehr, sehr viele schon sehr früh starben, Kinder starben sehr viel. Äh, wenn man das Schlimmste überstanden hatte und in einigermaßen geordneten Verhältnissen lebte, dann äh, wurde so ein Römer auch äh, 60 Jahre alt. Dann war er aber wirklich ein alter Mann und verbraucht. The health centers of Roman cities were the hot spring baths. Only wealthy Romans could afford doctors. Most came from Greece, like Galen. 
He started his Roman career as doctor to the gladiators and later became the emperor's personal physician. Many Romans had already finished work by lunchtime and spent the rest of the afternoon at the baths. They practiced sports, enjoyed the baths, or had a massage. Here, they were able to leave the dusty streets and hectic pace of city life behind. The Roman Museum of Archaeology houses the largest collection of artworks and everyday objects from ancient Rome. In the laboratories, specialists work tirelessly to preserve this heritage. The marble for these statues often came from far away, some of it from North Africa. Wealthy Romans commissioned these works to decorate their homes. But it was not the artists and artisans who were admired, it was the buyers. Beautiful objects gave the owners a higher social status and they enjoyed flaunting it. Everything can be found in the museum storerooms, from the simplest objects for daily use to magnificent artifacts from the Emperor's palace. These objects are eloquent about the city's splendor, but also about people whose lives were spent in the shadows. I diversi materiali che le differenti classi sociali potevano disporre nella Roma d'età imperiale erano determinati dalla disponibilità economica che queste classi potevano avere. Pertanto, per quanto concerne l'illuminazione, noi possiamo avere una casistica abbastanza esemplificativa. Per esempio, per le classi più elevate, noi abbiamo lucerne di bronzo, come questa che stiamo mostrando. Per le classi medie, invece, possiamo trovare lucerne invetriate, cioè di ceramica ricoperte da vetro, in tutto e per tutto simili a quelle di bronzo, però non di metallo. In ultimo, per le classi più povere, noi abbiamo esemplificazioni di eh, lucerne in terracotte prive di rivestimento. The Romans were fond of surrounding themselves with beautiful things. Even objects for daily use were created with an artistic sense. The humblest cooking utensils were decorated. Money. Everyone in Rome knew that anything could be bought with money. Even votes and official positions, traitors and informers. Rome never slept. Night was the time for delivering everything which would be needed the following day. But those who moved through Rome's dark streets at night had to be wary, and not just of gangs of robbers. Hey, come Drusus knows that arresting Petronius is only a question of time and money. Among the last drinkers, the arrest causes only a slight stir. But for Petronius, 
It is the beginning of a nightmare from which there will be no awakening. The Colosseum. Above was the arena. Down here stretches a labyrinth of narrow alleys and tiny chambers. Until recently, not all their functions were known. The architectural historian, Heinz-Jürgen Bester, has studied this complex minutely. He has concluded that the structures beneath the floor of the arena were part of an elaborate stage machinery that could suddenly release starving lions, panthers and tigers into the arena. With more than 100 performances per year, the Colosseum had to come up with more and more sensational acts to keep the public interested. Die heute leeren Amphitheatergänge hier im Untergeschoss müssen wir uns vorstellen mit einem Aufzugssystem gefüllt, was es eben ermöglichte, den Spielbetrieb in der Arena vom Untergeschoss in die Arena zu bringen, um dort einen exakten Spielablauf zu gewähren. What appeared miraculous to the spectators was really hard work performed by a skilled stage crew below the arena's wooden floor. While the crowds roared in their seats above, teams of soldiers, slaves and animal tamers were busy below running the stage machinery. Nowhere else could Romans get so close to their emperor. For him, the behavior of the crowds was a barometer of public sentiment. At times, he could even be booed. People and emperor watched the same spectacle. Despite the cruelty of combatants being stabbed or mauled to death for the audience, it was merely another entertainment. In den Rängen, die nicht für besondere Staatsgäste vorgesehen war, wo das allgemeine Volk saß, wurde sich Essen mitgebracht. Man aß entweder bei den Spielen oder in den Pausen. Erfrischungen konnte man eben auch an gewissen Ständen im Inneren des Kolosseums kaufen. Und eben, was auch hier die Grabung gezeigt haben, sind dementsprechend die Abfallstoffe, Kerne, Nussschalen, Pfirsichkerne, Kirschkerne bis hier runter in das Untergeschoss geschwemmt worden. Fifty-thousand people enjoyed watching men and women fight for their lives. Petronius has cheated the emperor and can expect no mercy. With murderers and temple robbers, he waits to make his entrance. With their bare hands, these hapless prisoners must fight lions and bears for public amusement. Many gladiators were highly trained professional fighters who could achieve recognition and even wealth. Some of them became celebrated stars, adored by a fanatical public. That is, as long as they manage to stay alive. At the Colosseum, the law was kill or be killed. Captain Drusus does not want to miss this spectacle, especially as it's his day off. He's looking forward to exciting games and unforgettable fights that will be talked about for days, not unlike sporting events in today's world. But there was some criticism as well. This is how the philosopher and politician Seneca condemned it. Man, 
once sacred to his own kind, is now murdered for amusement as if it were a game. People find the killing of one man at the hands of another a welcome spectacle. Visitors from all the provinces gathered at the world's largest arena to see the famous gladiators fight each other. Rome was mighty and it was merciless. The Roman Empire lasted a thousand years. Its center was the great city of Rome. With all the advantages of big city life, there were problems as well. The first city in history with a million inhabitants struggled with problems such as traffic congestion, housing shortages, and crime. Problems which routinely appear where a great number of people live together. They existed then as they do now, and they will most likely exist in the future.